Okay, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Karen Smith, and I'm the clinical ethicist for the Henry Ford Health System. I'd like to welcome you to our first Ethics for Lunch for 2019. And I would be hugely remiss if I didn't say a huge thank you to Veronica Hall for budgeting for us and supporting us with lunches this year for Ethics for Lunch. Yay. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, so our topic today is ethics and equity in caring for the LBGTQ plus community. And as always, I'm overwhelmed with the knowledge and expertise that we have within our system um, and the enthusiasm that our colleagues have for sharing their expertise with us for lunch. I've been really amazed by the amount of interest we've had for this particular Ethics for Lunch with my email box overflowing every day, even up to phone calls half an hour ago about how they could get on the live stream. So I welcome everyone that's live streaming this from Macomb, Wyandotte, Jackson, West Bloomfield, um, some of the cottages I think we're going to try. So I really welcome them and appreciate their tuning in. I'm sorry I can't get lunch to all the people that are at off-site places. But I want to let you know, the concept of ethics for lunch is really hoping to um, introduce you to ethical topics, give you something to chew on, some ideas, but really, the intent of Ethics for Lunch, there's no way that we could present everything or even a tiny amount of everything there is to know about caring for the LBGTQ plus community. It's really the tip of your learning iceberg. So I hope that you will gain some interest and knowledge from what we have to promote today um, and do some learning on your own and continue your education. We're going to talk about just some of the first steps today, and I'd like to introduce to you my panel. Um, if you guys could just stand and turn around for one second when I introduce you so people know who you are. Sarisha Shawcross is an NP. She's recently retired from Henry Ford, but she graciously agreed to return and share her expertise on this subject with us. As she's been committed to addressing health care disparities for a majority of her career, and she has a wealth of knowledge on this topic. We also have Christy Weichelwitz. She is a group practice director for the school-based and community program within the Department of Pediatrics here at Henry Ford Medical Group. She's the past recipient of the Henry Ford Health Service Diversity Hero Award for her passion of creating access to health and mental health services for some of the state's most vulnerable children and teens. She's also the parent of a transgender teen. Most recently, she's opened a health and wellness center inside the Ruth Elness Center, a community and drop-in center for the homeless and unstably housed young people who identify as LBGTQ. Aubrey Garfield currently works for us in Epic and Helios as a specialist, and she will graciously share some of her personal experiences with us as a patient in our health system. So I always start all my talks with this. Why is this an ethical issue, right? It's a matter of justice. Of course, it's also a matter of respect and respecting the unique dignity of each and every person. But it's a matter of justice as well, and that justice demands the fair treatment of individuals and the equitable allocation of health care dollars and resources. In light of the challenges inherent in defining justice, as there's lots of ways to define justice, it's fair to say that it's a concept involving fairness, equality, and equitable treatment. I find sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. And if you look at the first half of this picture, you can see that everyone is given equally a box to the ball game. They all have a box, yet they don't all have equal access to a view of the game, right? Justice is more than strict equality. It entails ensuring that all persons can obtain what is needed to have equal access to the things required for human flourishing, such as adequate health care. So this picture shows what it takes for equal access to a view, but demonstrates that differing levels of assistance are required just to reach that equal view to start the game, right? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. says, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. Shris is going to come up and share with us some of the ways that this plays out. 
Thank you. It's good to be back at Henry, though briefly. <laughs> so uh, in my experiences in working with vulnerable populations, the health risks for every vulnerable population is directly related to their ability to access care that is respectful and of high quality, that we meet the patient where they are at rather than where we are. And many times we have to really learn from them in doing this. These are some of the statistics that are available in a plethora of information. And of course, Wikipedia, which we know is always true, has their own set of statistics. Um, but we do know that gay and bisexual men are at risk for uh, certain STDs and account for more than half of all persons living with HIV or AIDS in the US. Lesbian women are less likely to have mammography or pap screening for cancer. And this is directly related to the approach of the provider to the patient. Um, that when the, when the patient feels that the provider is telling them to do something because it has to be done but not out of a genuine concern for their well-being, they're less likely to have anything done. We know we can give them a prescription and tell them to get it filled, but if we actually have a conversation with them about the importance of it, the chances of them getting that prescription filled and taking the medicine increase fourfold. Lesbian and bisexual women are more likely to be overweight and obese. And lesbian, gay, and bisexual persons are more likely to become disabled at a younger age than heterosexual individuals. And again, this is related to high risk behaviors, low access points for healthcare, and low adherence to a medica medical regimen that the patient feels engaged in. So the American Medical Association actually has a policy that, about the patient-physician relationship, respect for law and human rights. Physicians who offer their services to the public may not decline to accept patients because of race, color, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, or any other basis that would constitute invidious discrimination. Furthermore, physicians who are obligated under pre-existing contractual arrangements may not decline to accept patients as provided by those arrangements. And yet we see every day where providers refuse to care for patients based on race, religion, sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity. So in the US, there's approximately 150,000 youth and 1.4 million adults identify as transgender. How many of you believe that this is a true number? Right, people are shaking their head. Low reporting. There's a risk to reporting your gender identity and sexual orientation. There's inherent bias in our society. And henceforth, many people will not. 24% of transgender persons report unequal treatment in healthcare environments. 19% have reported refusal of care by providers or healthcare workers. 33% do not seek preventative services. They have enough going on, they don't want to intentionally put themselves in a situation where they know that they're not going to be treated well. So they stay away. And half of transgender patients report that they are teaching basic tenets to their providers. Surveys have been done as far as how many providers, how many physicians actually feel competent to care for transgender patients surveys of how many providers are willing to care for transgender. And at Henry Ford, 21% of our providers are not willing to care for transgender patients. 
So this is called peer pressure. So all of you are here, some of you because you have to be, but, but the rest of you are here because you're interested in this. So what can I do as a person to model the behaviors in caring for LGBTQ plus patients? So this is one of the diagrams um, that's used. There's different versions of this. Um, it's the, gen the gender bred person. Um, so we're looking at gender identity. And this is, do they identify as a man or a woman? So I am female by birth and I identify as a woman and my pronouns are she, hers. In the meeting that we have with Christy, when we introduce ourselves to the group, we always start our meeting not just with what my name is, but what my gender identity is. And more and more of that is happening in different fields. Gender expression. It's how you demonstrate your gender best based on traditional gender roles. So if I am born a man, but I express myself as, a, as feminine, then it would come in gender expression. Biologic sex, this is what our chromosomes say we are and what our physical anatomy at birth says we are. And then sexual orientation. Am I heterosexual? Do I only have sex, sex activities with members of the opposite sex? Am I bisexual or am I homosexual? Meaning having sex with the same sex that I am. So two of the, the parts on this are the sexual orientation and the gender identity. In EPIC, it is being abbreviated as SOGI, S-O-G-I, sexual orientation, gender identity. And there are questions available in EPIC. There are, there's a gradual rollout at Henry Ford as to how engaged um, the system wants to be in actually identifying and querying our patients, querying our patients to the different characteristics. Um, at this point, we're in the beginning. We're taking baby steps as a system. Um, but there are different tools that we would use depending on what the patient identifies under the SOGI questioning. So whose job is it? Well, the patient's first encounter is either with the call center staff or the front desk, right? So they definitely have a role to play. The medical assistant, just asking a patient, what name would you like me to call you? And not assuming that everybody wants to be called the name that's on their chart. My first name, I always abbreviated it because it was so difficult for people to pronounce. And so if anyone asked me what I wanted them to call me, then I would have given them a different name than what my full name is. And it has nothing to do with my sexual orientation. It has to do with treating me as a person. So obviously, once the patients are in the back, the medical assistants, the nurses, the doctors, the housekeeping staff, whether the patient's inpatient or they encounter housekeeping staff in any of the departments in the hospital. We didn't even include all of the support staff, the laboratory personnel, radiology personnel, cafeteria staff, and then obviously our volunteers. So everybody has a role to play in how we provide respectful care to our patients. We say that time and time again here, and this just really highlights a population that is not getting consistent, respectful care. So Christy, you're gonna be reviewing. See, it's so important that we did actually get a policy. So you know that it's true if there's a policy. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We do have a Henry Ford policy, gender-based non-discrimination policy, and I'm just gonna click on it. Did it come out? 
Okay. So it's quite lengthy, it's eight pages, but the main um, vein in this is that it covers all HFHS sites, all HFHS divisions, and departments, including patient rights and relations. So a lot of this is, um, it's actually really good policy that talks about respecting um, diversity and making sure that our patients feel comfortable. There is also um, a source in here for if a patient has an experience that feels um, not respectful, that they have, the, they, there is a process for making a report for it. Um, and that's all in here too. The other great thing about this is there, uh, there, there's a um, index that has a lot of definitions in it. So if you're ever curious, it's a great resource. Um, and it really just um, touches the surface. The resources, there are a lot more resources within um, the body as well. And these can be found on Henry. So you can just search. Um, if you search gender, it usually will pop up as one of the first ones. And if you can't find it, just let me know. We can find it for you. All right, how do we get back here? Uh, <laughs> right there. Oh, thank you. All right. So we talked a little bit earlier about what's being done. Um, we our EPIC is actually making some advances in 2019 to be able to capture what we call SOGI, which is the sexual or orientation gender identity information. Um, but Henry Ford has chosen not to roll out as quickly as EPIC is because we want to make sure that everybody knows how to handle this information. And so this is one of the first steps in us just getting out and getting information to people to know. A lot of people don't even know what SOGI is. It's pretty new. And so when we say that and we speak in acronyms a lot in healthcare, a lot of people don't even don't understand what we're saying. So we're trying to roll it out in, in a consistent manner, but also in a manner that makes sense to people that we don't want them to be overwhelmed if they're a CSR, a front desk person that's doing a registration, and this SOGI day comes up, and they're like, what is this? So we're trying to be as conscious as possible. We're working with the um, whole health system. We do have inclusive forms um, in certain departments that are paper forms, but the paper forms don't always match what is an EPIC. And so our providers have um, done a couple of workarounds, and if you need any assistance with that or any kind of um, insight to that, just reach out to me and I can connect you to somebody who can help you with that. So a lot of times when a patient comes in, um, Providers and, and support staff are unsure what to say. And so the way that we represent it is that, you know, A, you're always supposed to make sure that you are protecting somebody's um, privacy. So having a, having a public conversation, you shouldn't be having a public conversation with anyone. So if you, if you need to get more information from a patient, it's really great to pull them into a private area to where the two of you can just have a conversation. And, you know, never make any kind of assumption. So if you have questions and if that questions relate to their care or the ability for you to treat them, then you definitely want to make sure that you're asking it in a way that is sensitive to the person as well. So when you're asking someone their preferred name and their address or the, how to address them, and you can also put this in Epic as well so that if they're coming from the front desk to the MA, the MA can do that. The other thing that I just heard too is when, um, when we're, someone had said that um, they had labs done and that they, it was just the first letter and last name or first couple of letters of their last name. So that's always great because we have had people who have been waiting in a waiting room who are 
feeling vulnerable and their name hasn't changed legally. And they, um, it can be really um, unnerving for them as well. So just making sure that you're protecting everybody's privacy and, you, and that you wouldn't ask something to the rest of your patients that you would ask to this person. So keep that in mind as well. Or that you wouldn't ask to yourself or you would feel uncomfortable answering. So it's really a matter of just stopping and thinking, you know, is there a way for me to say this without a gender if I'm not certain how this person likes to be addressed? Or is there a way to um, approach this without someone's name? Or just getting creative. We do this all the time, we just don't think about it. So actually stopping, taking a beat, and just thinking how you can make that person feel comfortable um, is is a huge um, it's a huge benefit to the patients that are coming in for us. All right. Did you wanna? You want me just to play it? Okay. Go ahead. So, so this website has a lot of resources available. Uh, there's different videos that are available for different job classifications. And I just happened to pull one up because this really demonstrates the provider being willing to be vulnerable with their patient, to admit that they don't really know everything, they don't understand different things, and being able to have a conversation with the patient about that and how receptive the patient became as a result. Oh, and your sound isn't on. Let me pause. Hello, Kai. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm well, Kai. Last time we met, I recall your pronouns were he, his, him. Now, I don't want to make any assumptions. I always like to check with my patients again. What are your pronouns? Thanks for asking. They're Z, here, and here's. Okay, great. I'd like to make a note and let my other staff know. And could you spell those for me? Sure. Z-E-H-I-R-H-I-R-S. Okay, great. And please let me know if I make any mistakes. Oh, no problem. I will. In this scene, the clinician affirms the patient's gender identity by asking about any pronoun changes since the last visit. The clinician is also honest about the fact that these pronouns are unfamiliar to her, and she asks the patient to correct her if she makes a mistake. In addition, the clinician makes sure to record the pronouns in the medical record system so that the other staff members will refer to the patient correctly. So this is the page, and all of these are different scenarios that you can go to and just times of enlightenment. So why is it so complicated? And specifically when we're working with a transgender population and patients that identify as transgender, there are so many different combinations or levels of um, readiness and the ability to be able to have the outside match the inside for the person, if that makes sense. Um, some patients can't change their legal name or their gender marker on their identification or on their insurance. Some folks do, but in some cases, in, in, in the state of Michigan, you cannot have your uh, birth certificate changed. You can have your name legally changed. You can have your gender marker changed in a roundabout way on your driver's license, but you cannot have your gender assigned at birth changed on your birth certificate 
unless you have gender reassignment surgery. And so gender reassignment surgery is expensive and it's very painful and some of the results aren't the greatest now. So a lot of people don't have gender reassignment surgeries. Um, some patients don't want to transition. Some patients don't want to have surgeries. Some patients want to um, change their identity by taking hormones. Um, others don't want to take hormones. So it really is this all for you, every individual is different, just like you're seeing any other patient. So you're taking that patient as an individual and really learning who they are. And once again, this is on a, it's on a spectrum. It can change from the time that you see your patient to the next time that you see your patient, which is why the video is so great. All right. I had talked about it a little bit earlier about patient safety and um, patient safety issues, and we're going to bring Aubrey up now, and she is going to share her experiences. Hi, everyone. I'm Aubrey Garfield. I'm a supervisor with Community Connect in the Helios Department in IT, but that's not why I'm here today. I'm here more to tell about some of my own experiences here as a patient. Um, before we get to that, though, I'm going to be talking about patient safety issues and confidentiality. Like other forms of protected health information, unauthorized disclosure of a patient's sexual orientation or gender identity is a breach of that patient's confidentiality and violates HIPAA regulations. Such breaches should be taken seriously and documented in the RL system as, di as dictated by policy. This is much bigger than just following rules and regulations, though. For transgender patients in particular, privacy is a matter of personal safety. To put it as simply as I can, failing to protect the privacy of transgender patients puts lives at risk. The more marginalized the patient, the more at risk they are. According to data released by the Human Rights Campaign and other organizations, over the past five years, at least 128 transgender people have become the victims of fatal violence in the U.S. And out of those 128, it's estimated that at least 110 of those were transgender people of color. Even in the safest of facilities, revealing a patient's transgender gender identity in a public place or even just drawing attention to it puts them at risk for physical violence. Someone who overhears such a conversation could later choose to seek to do them harm when they later find themselves alone while walking to their car or trying to use the restroom or even when they return home. As a transgender woman, my personal safety is always on my mind. It's not something I thought a whole lot about before my transition, but it's now a part of my daily life. I evaluate every odd glance from a stranger to determine what they might be thinking of me and what my safety is, what my level of safety is in that current moment. Every reference that's made to my gender identity in a public place, even if it's by someone that I know and trust, causes me to immediately scan my surroundings to see who might have overheard. The statement that you see here on the screen is something that I wrote to put on my phone so that I could have something readily available to show to a friend or a family member that I was having a conversation with in a public place that I felt got to the point where it was putting my safety at risk. That could be due to someone being careless about my name or my pronouns, or even just because I'm having an open conversation with someone that I know and trust that I prefer not to be overheard by others. Having it on my phone allowed me to be able to show that to someone without having to verbalize it in a public setting when I already feel like I'm maybe potentially at risk. No matter what their intent, 
as the last piece of it says, no matter what their intent, outing me in public is something that puts my safety at risk that I have to take very seriously. And yes, if you're wondering, even speaking here today is something that made me consider how it would impact my safety. But for the sake of others that don't have a chance to speak up like this, I choose not to be silent. So a little bit more about me. I began my transition here at Henry Ford as both a patient and an employee in 2016, making my full-time public transition to living as a woman and using my new name on January 1st of 2017. I've been married to my wife, Melissa, for 19 years, since right after high school. We don't have any children, but we've raised five cats together. I work in IT. I also have a biblical studies degree, and I fly airplanes for fun. But if you really want to get me talking, ask me about the cats. <laughs> but don't say I didn't warn you, though. In the simplest of dictionary terms, being a transgender woman means that I was assigned male at birth, but I identify as female. The way that I would choose to describe my experience with my gender identity, which should not be taken as the way others would describe theirs, is that I was born female, but I was assigned male at birth by a doctor who took two second, a two-second look at me and decided that's what I should be. I've never personally felt comfortable saying I was born in the wrong body because that's not how I feel. To me, the problem was never me or my body. It was the way that I was treated by others and the expectations they placed on me because of that assignment that was made for me at birth. As a child, all I ever wanted was the freedom to express myself the way I wanted and to be the person that I wanted to be. Yes, I would still choose certain medical interventions later in life, but those were my decisions to make based on what I felt was needed. Everything else was external to me. If I would have been allowed to continue expressing myself the way that I wanted, instead of being shamed into conforming to everyone else's expect expectations of me, I know that this is who I would have grown up to be. I still got here, but it took about 30 years longer than I would have liked. So I have a couple of stories to share about my experiences as a patient. The first two occurred here at Henry Ford, both at the same location a couple of months apart. One is a positive experience that I look, on, look back on very fondly and I retell often. The other is less so. The two different outcomes were due to small differences that may have seemed inconsequential to the people that I encountered, but they made a world of difference to me. Before I continue, I'd like to say that for me, my overall experience here at Henry Ford being treated as a patient has been an extremely positive one. My two primary providers are truly exceptional caregivers, and I feel very lucky to have found them. I truly mean that, and I'm not just saying that in case they're out there listening. <laughs> but again, my experience should not be taken as the same experience as everyone else, because I know that not every transgender patient has had the same positive experience that I have. So the two encounters that I'm going to tell you about were both lab laboratory visits. The first one occurred on January 3rd, 2017, just two days after the date I had chosen to go full time. I hadn't thought much about it, but about one day before my appointment, I found myself in a total state of panic. I realized that this was the first appointment I was gonna be going to presenting as female, and none of my information had been updated in the system. I had been using my new name with my provider for some time, but I had requested that it not be documented in the system as my preferred name because out of fear that someone I knew might happen across it before I was ready. My, the, my court date for my name change was actually scheduled for the next day on Jan January 4th, but my gender had not yet been updated on my license or with my insurance. 
I was so terrified of walking into that appointment with a lab order that had a name and a gender on it that I no longer identified with, that I actually considered going into that appointment presenting as male and using my old name. This was no small thing for me. I feel ashamed now to, that I even considered it. I had made myself a promise that after January 1st of that year, I would never allow anyone to make me do that for any reason. And here I was two days in already considering giving in. Thankfully, I did not give in. After putting a lot of thought into it, I decided to put a note on my paperwork explaining that I was transgender and that my preferred name was Aubrey. By doing this, I hoped to avoid having any awkward conversations in the waiting room of the lab department about my name or my gender. When I got there, I got through registration without much of, much of an issue. I think the registrar took a quick look at my note and said something like, okay, I'll let them know in the back and just sent me back to sit down. When I was taken back by the lab tech though, she had me sit down and asked me to recite my name and birth date. Once again, in a state of panic, I didn't know what else to say, so I asked her which name she meant. With the note that I had written clearly in view, she pointed to my lab paperwork, and to me, it felt like she somewhat snidely said, the one that's on there. Lacking the confidence to speak up for myself, I quickly complied and recited my former name and my birth date. After I was done having my labs drawn, I walked out of there as quickly as I could and fought back tears on the way back to my car. Whether it was her intent or not, in that moment, that lab tech left me feeling dehumanized and ashamed of who I was. Worst of all, she left me angry at myself because I gave in and didn't stick up for myself. Fast forward a couple of months to March of that same year, I returned to the same lab for another lab visit. At this point, my name and gender had been legally changed, but had only recently been updated with my insurance, and I still had a paper order with my old name and, and gender on it. My patient name had been updated in the system, but I needed the registrar to update my gender and the name on card for my insurance that was documented in the system. Once again, I wrote all this on a note and attached it to my paperwork to avoid having to have that discussion in the waiting room. I was a little more confident going into this visit, but due to my previous experience, I was still a little apprehensive about coming in. Before she had even read what I had written on my note, the registration clerk greeted me very pleasantly and complimented me on my purse, which started to put me at ease right, off, right from the start. But then after she read what I had written, she looked back up at me and she told me I was beautiful and to not let anyone take that away from me. She said that if they tried to send them back to her and they would have to go through her. That small show of support made a world of difference to me. After going through the lab this time with no issues, I returned to my car after this visit with a big smile on my face, and I immediately called my wife when I got to my car and let her know what had happened. These two visits were at the same location for the same reason, but they resulted in two very different emotional responses from me as the patient. Thankfully, it's the positive one that I remember the most and retell the most often. It was in retelling that story that I was actually asked to be here today. I have one more story that I'd like to share. This one is from well before my transition, when I was being cared for in another health system and before I fully understood my gender identity. My primary care physician had noticed that my testosterone was low and sent me to an, an endocrinologist for treatment. After little discussion, my endocrinologist recommended that I be put on a testosterone supplement for treatment. Despite everything that I've been through, 
There are a few things that I would go back and change. For the most part, I am thankful for my experiences because they make me who I am and give me a unique outlook on life. One thing I do wish I could go back and change though that upsets me the most when I think about it is allowing my doctor to put me on testosterone. Taking testosterone made permanent changes to my body that I can't take back. For those things I have been able to fix, it has greatly increased the time money and pain that I've had to endure to be able to fix them. When I started taking estrogen eventually, that was after long conversations with my physician about what the effects would be on my body and what the risks would be. I also had to sign a lengthy informed consent form explaining that I understood all of that. There was no such conversations and no form to sign when my doctor put me on testosterone because it was understood to match the gender that was assigned to me at birth. I was simply told that my numbers were abnormal and that this would make them normal again. It seemed like good enough an explanation at the time, so without thinking much about it, I complied with my physician's orders. Looking back on it now, what I would ask of my physician as a patient would be to have had a more open conversation about whether or not that treatment was right for me and the permanent effects that it would have on my body. I may not have fully understood my gender identity at that time, but I'm certain if I would have known what the permanent effects would be, I would have chosen not to have taken it. What I would ask of everyone in this room and watching through our webinar recording is to treat every patient with the same compassion and respect regardless of their circumstances. The transgender patient that comes to you having limited access to resources or presenting with a gender expression that does not match your understanding of what gender looks like deserves the same dignity and respect as everyone else. Just coming to that first appointment may have taken all of the courage that they have, and it may not have been their first attempt at receiving care. If they are not treated with dignity, you may not see them again, leaving them at risk of falling between the cracks and becoming another statistic. Thank you. Thank you, Aubrey. All right, so we have several Henry Ford resources. Um, on the Henry Ford University, there's actually, a, it's about 35 minutes long. It is um, a training for improving healthcare for transgender and gender nonconforming people. You can see the description here, and there is a course link below. Um, but if you go to Henry Ford University and you search, you can search the word transgender, it'll pop up. And then also, too, um, we have a Henry Ford Health System Interdisciplinary Transgender Healthcare Improvement Team. We don't have an acronym for that one because it's way <laughs> too long. <laughs> but... Um, we started a couple of years ago pulling together um, specialists and individuals from around the health system that were already treating uh, transgender and gender nonconforming patients. And we have an amazing uh, panel and array of physicians, um, IT folks, people that work in um, the emergency room, other people that work in the OR. So it's really, really been a wonderful group. And if you're interested in that, you can email me. We've kind of suspended our meetings this year because we're trying to find a home for the group. Um, and so we're, we're still working on that. Um, we also have a website for patient resources, but a lot of times our call center will use it, and if you need to, you can use it as well. It's on henryford.com, and once again, if you go to Henry Ford and you put in the search engine transgender, it'll pop up as well. So it gives you an idea of the services that we provide. You can click on each one of them. It'll give you a little bit more information. We've got resources here as well. And then also, too, if you click on a full list of our services, it'll, it'll tell you that. It has them broken down on the left. And also, too, 
if you, oops, dang it. If you click on the individual, and I just lost it. <laughs> I just lost the whole thing. <laughs> if you click on, there it is. Come on. Okay. Is this going to go out to everybody? Yeah. Okay, good. They can. they can access it through the Henry Ford Ethics and Healthcare website. Okay. All right. So if you click on here, if you have a patient that is looking for a provider that provides services, either primary care or other services, you can go on here. And we actually have a list of providers with their photographs on there, which is nice for people so that they can see who's going to be seeing them. And then we have our references, which will be in the, um, will be in the presentation as well. And I think, Karen, you're doing Q&A. Okay. So I want to thank all of our presenters today. Wonderful job. Um, said I'm always excited by what I learn um, from my colleagues and from people willing to share with me. Um, we have about 10 minutes left for some questions. If you ask a question, I will have to repeat it so that people live streaming can hear. Okay? I'm sure I had to bring up questions. Okay? I'm wondering how you reconcile the non discrimination policy with the stat she gave that there's 20 odd percent of Henry Ford physicians who won't treat a transgender patient. Okay, so we're wondering how our non discrimination policy um, matches with the statistics which Sharisha shared with us about the number of even our physicians who have stated that they would be unwilling to serve um, a transgender patient. So that was a big motivator for getting the policy implemented and in place, realizing that there's a lot of training that has to happen with that. Um, there are some uh, training programs available that are pretty costly um, where we wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, but there are some types of things that we will be doing starting in summer, June, July. Uh, it's, it's that, you know, the, the revolving number here. Um, but there are a lot of, of scenarios that we have with that included in that policy um, rollout will also be the policy of patients refusing to be cared for by a provider of a different race, sex, religion than they are. So there's, there's a couple different things that we need to address as part of this having to do with respectful justice, um, quality care, and just how we as human beings treat each other in the midst of a world that is going crazy. So. Anybody else? Uh huh. I had a question about as far as like mandatory type of training for like positions of the frontline people that were mentioned in the um, in the presentation. Mm -hmm. Is there any move within the system to um, make that happen? Okay, so there's a question about how all of us, because we said who's responsible, all of us. How do all of us get training that we need in order to do, be able to provide um, better care? So when we created, when our group created the resource um, on the university, which is the 35-minute training, we actually tried to make it mandatory, and we took it as far as we could. Um, one of the issues around mandatory training, especially for the university, is that it's, it is all based on joint commission. So what the joint commission requires that your staff are trained in is what we get trained in. Those are our annual required trainings. So we tried as much as we could to promote um, it on a voluntary basis. Um, we're hoping, well, once again, with the world that we're living in, the Affordable Care Act is kind of tilted on its axis, and that was one of the one of the requirements for the Affordable Care Act. But we don't; it's 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 dying on the vine at the moment. So we're kind of in a holding pattern at the moment. Okay. Time for one more question. Going once, going twice. 
With that, I would really like to, oh, I, there's a question? Who? Yeah, okay. Question. Um, Dr. Rose. Sorry. Uh, you know, with these patients, when they experience more advanced or serious illness, because I work in palliative care and I actually do take care of patients with transgender at the end of her life, so I wonder what things we as an institution do, since we're so, have a lot of wonderful technologies and advancements in our treatments and we see sometimes patients with very advanced or progressive cancers or severe heart failure or respiratory failure, and how do we take care of those patients who have, beyond their medical needs, a very different psychosocial <coughs> needs that maybe our physicians are not as accustomed to? So Dr. Rose brings up the point about <laughs> You're testing me, I know. Dr. Rose brings up a point about how in acute care situations with patients with advanced diseases, um, when they are coming into the acute care hospital and needing a lot of acute care and advanced medical interventions, how we also then work to support their psychosocial needs during that time as well. Did I get that right? So, so what I say to that, actually, gosh, I'm glad I know this one, um, is that I, I think we do this. We do exactly what you all are doing here right now. We try to increase our own personal knowledge base and training. We try to do more than just the tip of the iceberg. We try to gain more knowledge. And I think um, in our leadership meeting yesterday, we said in order to gain the trust of our patients, we need to be vulnerable. And I think part of that is admitting what we don't know, saying, gosh, I want to provide you with the most excellent care that I can. You may be my first transgender patient. Please let me know if I make any missteps, and please help me be better. Um, I've gotten from Audrey that people are oftentimes open to helping us in the videos that says that. Sharing honestly um, what you need and asking, what can we do to make you feel better? What would make you feel more comfortable? You know, they're the simple things. What would you prefer to be called? Who is your family? What are your pronouns? Um, but then practicing those things as we move forward. So. That concludes our first Ethics for Lunch. I hope I'll see you all back here again in April. Thank you.